Today I'm speaking with Jonathan Van Maren. And Jonathan, I re recently came across a couple of your podcast episodes that dealt with the topic of pornography. And I've been really interested in this topic in looking at how porn impacts individuals, families, culture, relationships. And I, um, I listened to two that you did. You did one on um, uh, several years back now, you interviewed a former porn performer. Mm -hmm. And I really enjoyed the scope of that conversation and all the different aspects that you touched on. And then more recently, you did a solo podcast on how violent pornography may be contributing to some girls' gender dysphoria and desires not to be girls. And I I liked the the way you handled the topic, and I'm curious about how you got into this topic and what you've learned as you've been researching this. You were you had a lot of data at your fingertips when you were doing that more recent one, and I was impressed with that. Um, it you talk about a lot of things on your podcast. It seems like you deal with issues around abortion a lot, and you're pro life and uh, even assisted suicide and a lot of different topics. So how did, can you say a little bit about how you got into this and kind of how you came to discuss pornography in the way that you've been discussing it? So I, I first became aware of the extent to which pornography was impacting our culture because of the number of people around me that it was affecting. And that was very interesting because so I, I I kind of I'm 35 years old. The first smartphone came out the year after I graduated from high school. And so while there were people getting hooked on porn in high school, it was a lot more difficult to obtain it at the time. And so pornography was sort of this sort of background presence. It existed. Some people had it. You knew some people had it. You knew there was people looking at it. But uh, it very, very quickly, once the smartphone arrived, there was very little question um, about what this might mean, what the implications of everybody having access to everything all the time might mean, and what that meant for an entire generation of young men, and then more recently young women as well, is that they began to look at pornography, that the anonymity and the accessibility of pornography uh, that technology was granting them sparked something that is unprecedented in, in recorded human history, which is access to a phenomenal amount of sexual material um, and that sexual material becoming increasingly depraved. And so I started researching it because of the impact on those around me as more and more people started opening up about their struggles with pornography. Uh, and then I got invited by a pastor to give a presentation on, on the issue at a youth camp. I'd probably be pretty embarrassed to see a recording of that presentation now, because it was uh, it was just whatever research I could pull together. There wasn't a whole lot of it at that point. This was a dozen years ago. A lot of the research was very outdated because it dealt mostly with things like Playboy or Hustler magazine. Um, and then I've been essentially researching the subject ever since then. I had two chapters on it in my book, The Culture War, uh, and I speak on pornography regularly. I spoke to 3,000 students last year. And so a lot of what informs my research on pornography actually is what people are telling me about what pornography has done to them, what it's done to their relationships, uh, what it's done to their minds. And so with regards to the article on how violent pornography was spurring some girls to identify as not female, uh, most often as non-binary, sometimes as transmasculine or, tra or as a trans male, I don't know what the numbers of that are. I do, however, know definitively that it is at the root of some people's decision um, to reject femininity because they've told me that, their moms have told me that, their counselors have told me that. So I don't know enough, there is not enough data to know it's a trend, but I do know that this is something um, that is, is having a real world impact. And so I, I guess my, my conclusion to, to that question simply would be, it is now my conviction after uh, over a decade of research that it's impossible to understand any other cultural issue without also understanding uh, what it means for over 90% of men to be consuming pornography regularly and over 60% of women. You just can't understand any of the issues we're grappling with without, without also understanding the implications of that reality. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you see it as this as this foundational issue that's really impacting society in a number of ways. Yes. 
Yes. Um, I think that regardless of what issue you bring up, um, pornography interacts with it in some ways because pornography rewires the minds of those who are viewing at it. Uh, pornography is also a story and we think in stories. And so when people are watching pornography, they are instinctively, intuitively placing themselves in roles as they watch it, which is why pornography has groomed a generation of men to see themselves as sexual aggressors. It's groomed a generation of young women to think that violence in the romantic context should be acceptable, that there are behaviors they simply have to accept as the price of being um, in the sexual marketplace. And so these are things that we have to understand if we are to understand sexual violence, if we're to understand gender ideology, if we're to understand the red pill movement and the increasing acrimony um, that's taking place between, between the sexes writ large. All of these things uh, have many aspects to them, but pornography is one of the aspects that we need to consider to get a whole and comprehensive picture. Mm. And one of the things that you talked about in the recent podcast that you did um, was that we, when we think of kids and, and it seems like most kids are accessing this at, at least by the time they become a teenager, they've been exposed to pornography. I don't have the data in front of me, but I recently saw some statistics on this and it's an, a majority of children are being exposed to pornography, at least by yes. the time they've become a teenager. And, mm -hmm. and you said, when we think of that, we think, well, they're looking at naked pictures of people. They're looking at, at at people just having sex. But actually what's happening is the content has become more violent. And so there's themes within this that's not, it's not so benign. So sexual violence is the predominant theme in pornography. Now I would, I would make the case, uh, and I have made the case that porn is inherently objectifying. Um, like there are studies from Harvard University that track how the male mind responds to photographs of nude strangers. Mm -hmm. And it shows that the, the part of their brain that indicates tool use lights mm -hmm. up. So when we make the case that porn objectifies people, we're making a literal case as well as a moral case. Mm -hmm. So I, I oppose pornography morally. I also oppose it practically. And that's because porn does objectify the viewer and um, consistent consumption, therefore, has a view of how men view women and conversely, uh, how women view men, although it, it's it's different because there are real differences between how men and women see each other to begin with. And so because pornography is an addiction that escalates, like virtually every other addiction, there's very few smokers who stick to one or two cigarettes a day. Most of them sort of bottom out at around a pack a day. There's very few alcoholics who, who need two beers a day and that's it. Usually use escalates, same thing for drugs. And the same thing is true for pornography. And so in the last 10 to 15 years, we've seen a massive escalation in what used to be considered uh, like pornography, like Playboy, right, was photographs of naked people. And that hardcore pornography was videos of people having sex. Now, uh, like that, uh, those are borderline anodyne considering the mainstream content that's out there. You go to the front page of any of the top porn sites, um, Pornhub, for example, and you're going to see sexual violence as part of what's mainstream, part of what's normal. This is the kind of thing that people see upon first interaction with pornography. And so there's a lot of people who think, well, you'd have to go down all kinds of rabbit holes to get the weird stuff, to get the violent stuff. That was maybe true uh, five years ago. That's not true anymore. Hasn't been true for, for quite a while, actually. Um, the French prosecutor general actually uh, did, a, did a study into the impact of pornography, and he released his report in the fall. And he found that 90% of mainstream porn content featured primarily violence against women, that some of that violence would be considered torture under the Geneva Convention, and that this uh, material was having such a profoundly damaging impact on the way that young people in particular view sexuality, that it should be considered um, hate speech, mm -hmm. and that pornographers who are producing this stuff should be prosecuted. Uh, to give a secondary example, just to kind of show how this bleeds into real life, when I started researching this issue, and when I started doing uh, presentations on this issue, I'd never heard of the concept of choking as a sexual activity, ever. So mm -hmm. there's always been sadists, and there's always been masochists. We used to recognize that sadists were dangerous people, and that in the long term, they needed to either be restrained or locked up. Now, sadism, apparently, if it's a sexual taste, that doesn't make it creepier. That makes it more excusable. Uh, in bizarro world, in porn world, where, where people's views have been fundamentally perverted by the content they consume. And so what we've ended up with 
um, is a lot of the so-called sexual activity doesn't even really have a sexual component to it at all. Mm -hmm. There's nothing inherently sexual about choking, but it's the it's one of the number one things that is being viewed. Uh, the Atlantic magazine came up with a report a couple of years ago, and they indicated that 24 percent uh, of young American women um, expressed fear during intimacy because choking had been part of their experience in the first six months. Uh, the majority of American university um, age women said that uh, choking had happened almost immediately in their relationship. Uh, in the UK, similar data indicated that this was normalized among the young, that practices like this and other violent, unnatural sexual behaviors were so normal they were barely even discussed. Women would discuss them as, I don't want to do this, but this is sort of the price of entry into the sexual marketplace. Um, but but that's it. And, you know, there's like sex positive comedians in the UK, uh, young women who are now saying, I'm scared somebody's going to kill me at some point. Um, guys just sort of expect this. Um, and so the, the rise of choking is something that was probably some sort of fringe freak thing I'd never heard of uh, over 10 years ago when I started doing research. But it's now so common um, that the UK government is addressing this because they're hearing of preteens engaging in this behavior is one indication how how pornography has bled into our reality. And I think bled is precisely the right word there. I, I actually wanted to ask you about that, about choking, because I heard you talk about that. And I've, I've, I feel like I've heard that. I must have been exposed to that idea at some point, And I just sort of wrote, wrote it off as that sounds like that's probably some, like you said, some fringe thing. Maybe yeah. there's some genre of pornography that deals with that but hearing you discuss that i was really shocked because i don't see how that's a remotely sexual act it doesn't seem like it would have anything to do with sexuality well it's not and i, and I think that you know hardcore porn initially fused violence with sex right they needed they essentially needed to up the dopamine hits they needed to keep people interesting so they made sex more violent now in my view uh, a lot of the mainstream pornography isn't um, sex infused with violence. It's just sexualized violence. It's people inflicting uh, um, horror and pain and torture on each other. Um, and that's for the purposes of arousal. And we've collectively as a society shut up about this. We say that whatever people's tastes are is fine without admitting, in my view, the indisputable point that it is it is fundamentally problematic for people to be aroused by the idea of inflicting pain. Mm -hmm. um, and that it's especially it, it's especially horrifying when the stronger uh, um, um, per, a partner, which is usually the male, um, gets aroused by inflicting pain on the more vulnerable member, especially in a particularly vulnerable activity. And that this is the sexual landscape that young women in particular are expected to navigate. And I don't want to negate the impact this has on young men. It's profoundly damaging to young men. It's profoundly inhibiting to their future happiness. And it's, it, it, it creates sexual dysfunction at a level that, again, we've never before seen in recorded human history. But in terms of the, the victims that it creates, the sexual confusion that's been brought about and has been basically not addressed at all is frankly infuriating. We used to say it was wrong uh, for a man to hit a woman. Now it's apparently okay as long as it turns, her on, it turns him on. Uh, what yeah. strikes me as worse yeah I mean, you know that's that's one thing it seems like all of the this all of our sexual morality is being reduced down to the idea of consent so as yes. long as there's consent everything goes well and that it's it's so bizarre to me that the uh the discussions that were triggered by the me too movement never leaked into the porn industry mm -hmm. right so when the me too movement happened and i'm actually not one of those people who think it went went too far particularly mm -hmm. Um, because so there's a lot of times people bring up, you know, well, this comedian was just, you know, a real prick on a date. He didn't actually commit an assault. I'm like, I know. And he didn't go to jail, but people just found out that he acted like that towards women and decided they didn't support him anymore. That's mm -hmm. completely fine with me. Um, because it wouldn't be fine with me if, you know, they lied and said he committed assault and then mm -hmm. he went to prison. It's fine mm -hmm. with me. You know, if, if he acted like a jackass and people found out and decided they didn't want to support a jackass monetarily anymore, mm -hmm. that's fine. And what we found out, some of the, I think, the valuable discussions that happened um, post Me Too was the reality that there are power dynamics in different workplaces, that there are power dynamics present in different relationships, and therefore that um, consent means more or less in different contexts. Mm -hmm. And so the concept of consent means less 
you know, when Harvey Weinstein is cornering you in a hotel room and you're a 19 year old actress. Mm -hmm. We recognize that although there might um, like the, 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 the discussion surrounding what legal culpability looks like and what moral culpability does not detract from the reality that obviously um, there were power dynamics at play that contributed to the victimization. And so now, for some reason, we just say, well, but it's all about consent. And so if somebody consents to be tortured to, we don't have to ask ourselves, why would somebody consent to be tortured to? We don't mm -hmm. ask ourselves, why would somebody um, be, be aroused by the, the prospect of perpetrating violence against a female? And w is there any cultural coercion? Is there any peer pressure? Um, is there anything in the young woman's past that would make her see this sort of violence against her person as acceptable in the first place? Because consent has been erected as this standard by which we judge all behavior, we've eliminated our ability to have a sane discussion about violence against people. And so mm -hmm. it's it's immensely frustrating to me uh, that the Me Too movement has not sparked a greater um, examination of the porn industry, considering the fact that the porn industry informs so many of our cultural phenomenon, right? Like Hugh Hefner died just a couple of years before Harvey Weinstein was outed as a predator. Mm -hmm. And then The Secrets of Playboy was released on A&E, which revealed the fact that this man was unsurprisingly a notorious pervert. And I use that word very advisedly, uh, that he got off on violence against women, um, that the, the Playboy Mansion was actually a playground of predation where many young women suffered all, all manner of abuse, including violent rape. Um, and that story kind of fizzled. You know, his celebrity pals were never asked um, what they had to say about him now. We never asked ourselves if, if the guy who produced what now is now considered softcore was into this stuff. You know, what about the digital giants? What are our kids watching? Mm -hmm. So we've had so many opportunities to have broader discussions about what the porn industry is doing to our culture. And we've missed quite a lot of them. We've made some progress over 10 years, mm -hmm. but not nearly fast enough for my taste. Mm -hmm. and, and when you talk about consent in that way and, and relate it to me too, it one of the things I wonder is, is it possible for a a woman to give meaningful consent when there are financial and other social pressures at play? So I, I would say no, one, morally. I'm morally opposed to it writ large. So if the mm -hmm. audience would like to know about my bias, that's my bias. Mm -hmm. um, I think that it's wrong to intentionally inflict pain on somebody else. I think it's worse when you do it because it turns you on. So mm -hmm. that's my moral position. Um, but I would also agree with you for 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 legal reasons, for example. Mm -hmm. And so we recognize that you're not permitted to give consent to certain things. And there was actually a, a column in the Globe and Mail by a lawyer after a pseudo celebrity here who got outed as somebody who was engaging in various violent practices. Um, this is here in Canada. He had been engaging in things like choking and his defense was, um, this was consensual. His defense was, this was a 50 shades of gray relationship. Hmm. And a lawyer came out in the globe and mail and said, you're not actually allowed, you're not allowed to consent uh, to this. Um, like I, I, I could step out of a bar with somebody and get into a fist fight with him. And even if we both consented to the fight, if I crack his skull on a curb, mm -hmm. I'm still going to jail because he's not legally permitted to give me consent to violence against his person. The same way you're not allowed to give consent to get paid below the minimum wage. Mm -hmm. So I also think legally speaking, we could kill the porn industry overnight if we just applied laws that already exist. Mm -hmm. How did violence become such a part of this? Do you think I it, it doesn't I I don't consume pornography and I I I know when I've had conversations about this with with other people, um, one of the things that I hear is well I don't watch that kind of stuff I you know that that's that's I'm, I I use uh, somebody said uh, minimally disgusting pornography like uh, just uh, just a woman by herself the OnlyFans kind of thing there's this. The, you know, this idea that not everybody's watching violent porn. So how big a part of the porn scene is violence and how did that become such a big part of the porn scene? Uh, so if somebody's going on to Pornhub or X Hamster or any of the other massive digital giants, they're going to be exposed to sexual violence. I'd be interested to know what their definition of sexual violence is, mm -hmm. because what I've found is that that seems to be a moving target. That mm -hmm. as we climatize to new behaviors, we've changed our mind on what things constitute violence and what do not. And so suddenly you can have torture devices as part of a sexual relationship, but they call it a kink or a fetish instead of violence, even though violence is by definition the point. 
Um, and so obviously violence would not be a predominant part of things like OnlyFans, which is sort of obviously a sort of a more of a subscriber model. It's more personalized pornography. Um, I don't say that all people look at violent porn. I say that all consumers of mainstream porn are going to be exposed to it. And that violent porn is in fact uh, mainstream. I would argue that so, well, I wouldn't argue, I would assert um, that when it comes to um, pornography, the reason it became violent, of course, is the, the brain craves novelty. Mm -hmm. And in order for people to be consuming porn regularly, they eventually don't want to see the same stuff that used to be considered hardcore is now considered vanilla. They escalate their use, mm -hmm. which means it's not just pornographic violence. There's all kinds of unthinkably weird stuff. Um, like in some of the books, I've got a whole shelf of, uh, of of research behind me. There are chapters I only read a few pages of because I just simply didn't want to know. Mm. Um, I recognize that there are doors behind which, you know, and here be dragons. Um, and so there's all kinds of weird stuff. It's not just violence. Violence is probably just, it, violence is the aspect that disturbs me the most because I think it has had uh, the most potent cultural impact. Where the violence went mainstream, I think, where it broke from a thing that millions of men were guiltily watching uh, to a thing that was accepted culturally was the Fifty Shades of Grey phenomenon. Mm. Because this was a, you know, a torture porn trilogy written by the woman going under the pseudonym of E.L. James. Um, this this, this uh, trilogy sold 150 million copies. You could buy it at Walmart or at the airport bookstore. And, 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 and it made people unashamed to read about violence being perpetrated against a woman under the guise of romance on the plane, you know, or in, in a coffee shop or in very, very open settings. And what, what that book and then the follow-up Hollywood trilogy, um, which was initially the, the film release was actually protested by, by uh, feminist activists and, and members of battered women's shelters, because it said, this story doesn't end at the altar. It ends in the cemetery. Usually an abusive relationship like this. Mm -hmm. um, I don't care how much you romanticize it. It's inherently dysfunctional, degrading and violent, but it did two things. It persuaded uh, an enormous number of women um, that this was something that they could consider or maybe should consider. And it emboldened a lot of men to feel entitled to ask for things um, that they ordinarily wouldn't have, that they would have watched in pornography, but they would never have considered asking their partner, hey, can I inflict pain on you? Um, are you into sadism? Because I'm into sadism. They would have recognized that as a shameful and creepy thing. And I think it is a shameful and creepy thing. Mm -hmm. um, that we, the people have instincts and desires that should be repressed, not nurtured and encouraged. But what pornography did was it nurtured and encouraged and then metastasized um, the desires of millions and millions of people. And in, in, in many cases, many porn addicts have told me, introduced desires they didn't even know that they had. Sort of sent the digital demons screaming down the dark caverns of their mind and doors they didn't know were back there started rattling. Um, and then sustained porn consumption let them out. Mm -hmm. And so what this sort of did was it was a match, it was a match made in hell. You have young men um, looking at pornography in which women are beaten and abused and otherwise tormented. And then you have this torture porn trilogy um, of novels that, you know, young, many young women and older and middle-aged women read. And this has created a scenario in which a lot of sexual violence now gets pushed into the romantic category. Mm -hmm. And I think the moment in, in Canada that I really saw it go mainstream was when that uh, that radio host that I, that I mentioned earlier, um, when he was accused, he came out and said, this is a Fifty Shades of Grey relationship. That wasn't particularly surprising, but Canada's largest and most liberal newspaper, the Toronto Star, uh, the way they covered the story, this is back in like 2017, really struck me. Um, their headline was, Gian Gomeshi accused of unwanted sexual violence. And the fact that a progressive paper would say unwanted sexual violence with the inherent implication being- That you could want it. Like, wanted sexual violence encapsulated the whole shift for me. Wow. Wow. Yeah. That's really, that's really stunning. Um, you mentioned pornography's effect on men, and that's something that, that I've been, I found particularly interesting. It, uh, it does not seem like it is just a, it's a guilty pleasure. It actually causes larger problems. And I wonder if you could speak to that a little bit. Well, so there, there's many different 
problems. Um, the first would be the fact that our, our brains consist of something called neuroplasticity. And this means that when you're viewing pornography, you're actually um, um, causing, um, facilitating physiological changes in your brain. Mm -hmm. You actually create neural wiring. You create a system of sort of dopamine receptors that desperately crave pornography at all times, which is why it's an incredibly difficult addiction to break. It also taps into first natural desires, which is why pornography is so widespread, right? Um, you know, so there, are, there are millions upon millions of people who will never be remotely tempted uh, by drugs that you inject or snort or, uh, or smoke that won't be attracted to cigarettes or don't like the taste of alcohol, for example. Pornography, because we're all sexual beings, is something that everybody is susceptible to. You just have to come across the right stuff at the wrong time. And there you go. Um, so um, people are very susceptible to pornography. And every time they look at pornography, they're actually creating neural wiring. There's a fascinating chapter on this, actually, in a book called The Brain That Changes Itself by uh, Dr. Norman Doidge, who is now uh, primarily known for writing the, uh, the foreword to Jordan Peterson's first book, mm -hmm. but is a fascinating neuroscientist in his own right. And that book actually has an entire chapter just on how pornography reshapes the, the physical landscape of our brain. If you put brain scans uh, of somebody who compulsively views pornography next to the brain scan of somebody who doesn't, you can tell the difference uh, between, between those two brains. And so people think that they're kind of making, you know, maybe a moral decision. You know, I shouldn't be looking at porn, but I am. Maybe a spiritual decision if they're religious. This is a sinful thing that I shouldn't do. Very few people realize that they're making a physical decision about the way their brain looks. So just like smoking will turn your lungs black, pornography will also shape your brain. It will give you a, a pornified brain. And for those who'd like to see the accumulated evidence easily available online, I would encourage you to check out uh, This Is Your Brain on Porn, um, which is all the, the evidence that's been compiled by, by Dr. Gary Wilson. We've known this for quite some, some time now, that pornography is, is fundamentally addictive. Uh, one psychiatrist compared the initial reaction to seeing porn as like it reaches out and kind of grabs hold of you when you see it. Mm -hmm. um, we have very, very uh, few defenses against sexual material. Mm -hmm. And for most of the existence of humanity, we didn't have access to it like we like we have it now. Um, and so pornography, therefore, has reshaped our minds because it's reshaped our minds. It's reshaped our sexual tastes and introduced new sexual taste and normalized behaviors that were previously and justifiably considered awful. And then third, um, it's actually wired our brains to pornography in ways that make it very difficult to function in a normal relationship, not just as you can imagine, emotionally and romantically, but also uh, physically. We have extraordinary and skyrocketing rates of erectile dysfunction in young men under the age of 30, which has not been a problem for young men under the age of 30 in previous years. Mm -hmm. so pornography is fundamentally damaging on virtually every level. There's nothing good to be said about it. Do you believe that there's any safe amount of porn that someone can consume and not become addicted to it? No. Um, so I would say that first and foremost, uh, for moral reasons, because I think that pornography is inherently objectifying. I think that on a moral level, um, but I also think that because the evidence indicates that that's the way that our brain sees pornography. You don't get to choose how you see pornography. Uh, the way that you're wired is the way that you're wired and the way that men see pornography is they see an object, not a person. And that's fundamentally problematic because it's teaching you a story that's profoundly damaging to your view of the opposite sex. So no, there's no safe amount of objectification. I don't think we should objectify women just a little or vice versa for that matter. Uh, so no, I don't. Uh, two, it's kind of like, um, I would compare that question to saying, I think there's a safe amount of, of cocaine or heroin or crystal meth. Um, pornography, I would argue, is more addictive than those substances um, and just as damaging to your health, your moral health. Um, but also uh, your mental health. And so can some people consume pornography once in a while and white knuckle their way through not becoming compulsive users? Yeah, I'm sure that's true. I'm sure there are, are, are people who, who can, uh, you know, white knuckle their way through being recreational cocaine users as well. There are aberrations. Um, but I would, I would disagree with it on moral grounds first and foremost. I don't think we should even objectify each other a little bit. Um, and then I would also argue that just from a, a harm reduction perspective, it's an incredibly unwise and frankly stupid thing uh, to think that you're going to be one of the four guys who doesn't actually get hooked.
I've done a couple of these conversations or I've hosted a couple of conversations around porn. And one of the comments that I, I see some version of often is uh, a man will comment, well, I'm lonely and I have no prospects of ever having a romantic relationship due to X, Y, Z factors in my life. What am I supposed to do? And so there's this sort of sense of, of entitlement to some sort of sexual fulfillment and pornography being there and being this thing that already exists. Why can't I just take advantage of that for myself because I don't have anything else in my life? Do you have kind of a response to that or thoughts about that argument? No, I have a list of responses. Uh, the first one is that the ends don't justify the means. I, I don't think that because you're lonely um, that you're now entitled to objectify people. I think that um, if you think, well, I, I can't have a partner, pornography with every viewing is going to make you less suitable to be a partner to begin with. And so pornography will damage any future prospects that you have and will give you a view of women that is profoundly damaging should you be in a relationship. I don't advise anybody to date somebody who, who regularly views pornography. I don't think it's a healthy thing to do for either of the people in the relationship. And I don't think somebody viewing pornography is in the right place to be in a relationship because they are rendering themselves incapable of being the sort of person um, who can give themselves uh, to a partner. Um, to be a nurturing and loving and emotionally available companion. Pornography destroys all of that. Um, I would also argue that pornography is simply the wrong solution to loneliness, um, which is not to say that um, the solution isn't very, very difficult and is not to ignore the tremendous amount of despair that people feel in our postmodern digital age in which loneliness is, is an epidemic. You have you know, national governments having departments of loneliness. You Google loneliness studies and you're going to get hundreds of thousands of hits and this is sort of a, a new field of study that's cropped up overnight. But just as I would say that heroin and cocaine uh, are not the best way to deal with depression, even if it might make you feel briefly better, I would argue that pornography is not a solution to your lack of intimacy, that pornography will isolate you further, make you feel alone. Um, it's kind of like, I'm thirsty, let's drink salt water, because that'll make me less thirsty. Well, no, it'll just make you crave the real thing more but all you have is the fake thing. And so quite frankly, you're putting yourself in a really, really awful cycle that will um, increase your loneliness, increase your despair and make you less suitable for intimacy in the future. That's well, the short it, version. That's a, that's a, yeah, that's a good response. And I, uh, I wonder, you know, in addition to how pornography impacts the user, there's also the performer side. And that's something that, I think kind of gets glossed over to some extent, like these are people freely engaging in this. They are, uh, you hear uh, apologists for this saying that, um, I, I think that the, isn't the, the leading advocacy group for the porn industry called the Free Speech Coalition? Yeah. And so there's this, this idea that uh, this is empowering somehow and liberating and, uh, just sexually um, empowering for for women to do, and and yet when I hear stories like the the woman who spoke with you, I think her name was Deanna Spangler a couple of years ago in that podcast episode, and I've heard a couple of others. It it's profoundly sad. It seems like these are people who've got a lot of emotional wounds and aren't healthy going into this. I don't know what you've found in that regard. Oh, for sure. So I've interviewed quite a few uh, former porn performers, but we can go all the way back to the first major public porn film in America, which was Deep Throat. Mm -hmm. um, it was a very celebrated film. It aired in all the big venues in, in New York City. Um, you know, the screening was attended, um, you know, by sort of cultural elites like Jacqueline Kennedy Anassis and Truman Capote mm -hmm. and Jack Nicholson. Oh, wow. And they all went out to see this 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 pornographic film. And then we found out later that the woman in the film had been coerced into being in that film and that she as soon as she could escape, she did. And she became an anti-porn activist for the rest of her life and wrote uh, um, uh, um, uh, a memoir that I don't think gets referred to often enough, exposing a lot of the horrifying things being done in the Playboy Mansion. So we can go all the way back uh, to when it was softcore uh, pornography. Um, but the... Uh, if we listen to the people who have left the porn industry, you find out everything that you need to know. Um, the, the interview that you mentioned was just one example. Um, but I, I remember uh, another woman who's still not opposed to pornography. Uh, she became known as the Duke University porn star and her porn name was uh, was Belle Knox. Her real name was Miriam Weeks. She was a student that was shooting, uh, shooting porn uh, in order to pay her tuition. 
Um, she two two three years into this, having made a whole bunch of money, she did this documentary that was supposed to be kind of mildly pro porn, where she talked about her 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 uh, experiences, and she said everybody in the movement gets trafficked at some point or another. You're constantly under pressure uh, to to do things you wouldn't do. They'll shoot a video clip at the beginning of the shoot and say, "Do you agree to what we're about to do?" And they'll say yes, and then the guy will do other stuff, and you're stuck because you've already given a legal sign off. So mm -hmm. again, I'm morally opposed to all of it regardless, because mm -hmm. I don't think that emotionally and sexually healthy people go into porn scenes. I don't think that emotionally and sexually healthy people um, have sex with hundreds of strangers and do degrading things, objectively degrading things uh, for money. At the same time though, I, I, I think that if you take coercion, trafficking, and grooming out of pornography, the industry it collapses like a wet cardboard box overnight. Mm. And anybody who's interested in hearing the truth about this will just look at those who have left the industry, not those who are still inside the industry. We recognize that whistleblowers leave an industry. Um, and so I would also ask, if you look at the mainstream stuff uh, coming out on Pornhub, so a lot of people say, like, look, Pornhub is this horrifying organization. Uh, Nicholas Kristof, uh, Pulitzer uh, Prize winner of the New York Times, uh, wrote an article that made shockwaves and caused a lot of corporations to cut ties with Pornhub called The Children of Pornhub, where he revealed that a lot of rape videos are getting monetized, a lot of sexual violence videos are being monetized. What people didn't discuss that should have been mentioned more is that the reason Pornhub got away with it for so long is because it was so difficult to tell the difference between a genuine sexual torture video without consent and one with. Mm. Um, that it was genuinely difficult to tell the difference between somebody consensually being, um, being tortured and somebody who was not. Mm. Uh, that's deliberate and that's by design. Well, and it seems like people who are who go who have a critical eye towards this content are probably less likely to be examining it because they are wanting to stay away from it in the first place so the people who would be in in the position to view this are either promoting it or guiltily consuming it so how yeah i guess that's something right. i kind of wonder is like if you're doing research on this yeah. how do you protect yourself from being hooked into it or or finding yourself consuming it and and experiencing the normal physiological arousal that would happen when you're consuming this material because as you mentioned it's sort of this thing that it's exposing you to a very primal level of desire that we all have so i mean for me one of the reasons that i don't consume it i've never been into it is because i don't want to go there i don't want to experience i i also have a moral objection to it and I don't want to even expose myself to the temptation to see that kind of thing. So I, with a critical eye, would not be the one checking this stuff out to see what it contains. Yeah. So I agree with all of that. I have the same fear as you. I am frankly terrified of pornography because it wields a power that very few people can resist. Mm -hmm. um, I don't watch pornography. I haven't read Fifty Shades of Grey or seen the films. The way that I do research is I rely on academic research. Uh, and so uh, the first book that I read, and I, as I mentioned earlier, I didn't read, I didn't even read all the chapters all the way through because mm -hmm. there were things I didn't want to know, um, was Pornland, uh, How Pornography Hijacked um, Our Sexuality by Dr. Gail Dines. She is um, a feminist scholar. She actually has watched a lot of this stuff. She has an, analyzed it academically. I'm morally opposed to looking at it, and I wouldn't. Um, maybe that makes me hypocritical for using her research, but I do. Same thing, another book, uh, Pornified by Pamela Paul, is another book that I, I relied on for my initial research. Now, however, there's an enormous amount of studies. Like It is very simple to research the porn industry without ever exposing yourself, not just to pornographic images, but to no imagery whatsoever. So there was five or six major studies that came out last year. A huge report, and I'm talking all different countries, a, a huge report that came out earlier this year from the UK uh, detailing the impact uh, of pornography. Uh, there's, there's new books coming out consistently. One of the organizations that's been doing um, a lot of research and has people actually viewing the content on Pornhub uh, would be um, uh, the organization or movement, as they call it, Hashtag Trafficking Hub, mm -hmm. which is run by Layla Micklewaite, um, previously of Exodus Cry. Exodus Cry is an organization fighting sexual exploitation in all its uh, forms. It has a, a documentary, Nefarious Merchant of Souls, which examines sex trafficking. They also have a series uh, on the porn industry um, where they deal with things where they, they've got some things blurred out, but then primarily interviews 
-hmm. I frankly found that even, even with blurred out stuff, simply too graphic for me. Um, and so I abandoned it part way through. Um, at one point, I actually, there was a documentary that I, uh, what was it called? Uh, it was a documentary that they aired. Um, well, there was, so there was one on Netflix exposing Pornhub um, that I couldn't even make it all the way through the trailer because of the explicit material. Mm -hmm. So what I find often is then I'll, re I'll rely on a review mm -hmm. um, because there's, there's plenty of anti-porn activists there who will summarize the findings. And if there's any like new evidence against the porn industry contained in that documentary, I can access that, that evidence without watching it. Mm -hmm. So um, I yeah I I'm very very careful and try mm -hmm. to be try to be as careful as I possibly can and stay away from from any content that might that might trigger anything in me or make me go down any rabbit hole because again um, you're precisely right um, we have urges and desires that we can't control mm -hmm. and and when it comes to pornography the only way to engage with it is frankly to stay away from it to mm -hmm. stay away from the imagery so I don't read the stuff I don't watch the stuff I don't look at the stuff. Um, and I don't even watch all of the documentaries that are exposing it um, because I find that some of that stuff, I, I think especially because I haven't seen the stuff that I'm writing about, even when they release it in blurred form, it's still too graphic for me because I'm not as desensitized as somebody um, might be who's seen all the hardcore stuff. Cause I've been told like, how can you, you know, how can you find this stuff really graphic? Mm -hmm. like, well, if, if you haven't seen the really bad stuff then this stuff still seems really graphic, right? Because our culture has mm -hmm. been desensitized. Does that make sense? It does make sense. Yeah. And going back to kids and pornography exposure, I, I just watched a TED talk the other day by somebody named Emily Rothman, who was promoting a concept called porn literacy. And this was a, this was a, a talk she gave. And in the talk, she's, she's this adult woman and she's mm -hmm. laughing about kids consuming porn. She's just laughing about how they want to talk about porn and how she talks to teenagers about pornography and she tries to present her case as if she's she's pretty neutral on this. Like there's a there's a level of neutrality that we can have with it. She's not anti-porn, but she's not pro-porn either. She wants to help give kids the tools to understand what they're seeing and put it in context. And I was I'm I, I'm pretty horrified by the thought of anybody talking to kids about I I don't know. I mean, I'm trying to I'm trying to wrap my brain around this really because I uh I don't know that that there's a healthy neutrality that you can find with this. Yes, the kids might have been exposed to this, and I think that we're seeing the statistics that say that they they have. Yes. And how do you deal with that after kids have been exposed to this? Do you do is is the idea of porn literacy something that's a that's a good idea? Should we have classes to teach kids about how to put this in context? Should we just be telling kids avoid this? And you know, how do we talk to children about this? Well, so both, right? Like, the, he, so here's the thing. I don't object to the the phrase porn literacy. Okay. Um, again, I give presentations on pornography in schools all the time. Mm -hmm. But my idea of porn literacy would be, this is what pornography is. This is what it does to you. Here's the story that it conveys. And that's why it must be rejected. If you have been exposed to it, here's how you need to reframe your thoughts. Here's how you can heal your brain. Mm -hmm. um, here's how um, you can eliminate uh, the the neural wiring. Here's how you can take advantage of neuroplasticity by abstinence from this digital material, so that your brain can be rewired and you can understand intimacy in a healthy way. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what I would I would mean. What they mean by uh, porn literacy or the other phrase that gets batted around a lot is uh, ethical porn mm -hmm. is essentially they're saying you know pornography is a human need is it, or a, just it's a human reality and as such. Um, we're not uh, pro-porn or anti-porn, but we accept that porn exists, um, that despite the fact that a very short uh, number, a number of years ago, um, in historical terms, this was not widely available, despite the fact um, that the constitutional tools exist in Canada, uh, the United States, and most European countries to ban pornography if they wanted to, especially if we treated it as hate speech or a toxic substance, which I think we should. Um, that we're going to accept this reality and we're going to accept the rewiring of minds and try to and try to contextualize it. Now, the difficulty is, is that it, this just ignores the reality of what porn is. It, it, it ignore, ignores the, the addictive reality of how porn functions. But also, I'm very interested in, well, what do you mean by ethical porn? So I reject the phrase ethical porn because I don't think any porn is ethical. Again, it's, it's inherently um, objectifying. And I don't think that that's uh, that's moral or healthy. 
However, one of the, the first books to use that phrase um, was by Dr. David Lay, uh, one of the people we nicknamed the porn profs because they spend all their time defending the porn industry. And his book uh, was, was titled um, Ethical Porn for Dicks. And he uh, constantly attacks the idea that pornography is addictive, primarily because, uh, um, to my understanding, he's addicted to pornography himself. And uh, I, I engaged with him uh, on Twitter on this issue just to kind of get a sense of what his view of the ethics of porn would be. And so I said to him, uh, the most common, one of the most common words, at least that was true 10 years ago, it's much worse now, but one of the really common phrases um, to refer to women in the porn, in, in porn scenes was the C word. The language is so incredibly dehumanizing in pornography that Gail Dines has an entire chapter on it in her book. I only got a couple of pages into it. I'm like, okay, I know, you know, I know what's all the way at the bottom of the sewer. It's the same stuff at the top, but I don't even want these phrases in my head. Um, and so what I asked him was, do you think there's something morally objectionable to a man being aroused by a woman being referred to in this way? Because in my view, the C word is the is to misogyny what the N word is to racism, for example. Mm. It's an unacceptable term um, um, by all standards. It, it's a crude reductionist term um, that reduces a woman to a sexual object in the most degrading and deliberately vile way possible. And first he refused to answer the question. And finally I said, like, look, just one question, because I want to know where your moral compass is with regards to ethical porn. And he says, like, as if that's what, if essentially, if that's what turns somebody on, then who am I to judge? It is, it is acceptable. And that's all I need to know um, about, about ethical porn. That's all I need to know about the view that he's promulgating. I do not want to live in a society where the vast majority of people um, are arousing themselves to women being deliberately degraded, called horrifying names, um, and, and being subject to what we would have recognized as humiliation. Mm -hmm. I don't want to live in a society where where the, the, the mainstream porn genre includes in its acronym uh, sadism and masochism. I don't. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that sane people used to collectively recognize that. And when we talk about this openly and bluntly, I think people come around with that idea very quickly, which is why I think that we need to talk about pornography, not crudely, but bluntly. Mm -hmm. So not to participate in the degradation of our culture, even in terms of conversation, but to bluntly highlight what they're defending. So I don't want to hear the garbage phrases about ethical porn. I want to know if you think it's acceptable to be aroused to a woman being referred to it this way. And he, in fact, does. That, for him, falls inside the boundaries of ethical porn. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not interested in participating in a conversation that's just a flimsy cover uh, for people's perverted uh, um, fetishes and frankly, in my view, mostly woman hatred. You, in that, in that same that that reminds me in that same TED talk that I referenced a moment ago, the presenter gave a definition of sex positivity that was basically sex positive means we're okay with whatever you want to do, it, uh, whatever somebody wants to do. We don't we don't make moral judgments about that. It's all fine. As long as there's, I think she said clear and enthusiastic consent. So again, it comes back to this consent based sexual morality. And I know that one of the arguments from, I like that phrase that you use the porn profs, because I do see these, these main names that seem to be out there with, you know, credentials after their name, but just defending pornography as if they're paid by the industry, which I don't know if they are or not, but there it's just a full-time job to, to defend the industry. Um, and one of the things that I see a lot is that objection to porn is, is all about shame. And so it's the, sh it's shame and moralizing that need to be stopped, not pornography. The problem is your thoughts about it, not the porn. You should just stop feeling guilty about it. And that's that's what it comes down to. And so there's this ridiculing of the idea that you would have any kind of sexual morality beyond just this consent-based, uh, this, this attitude that if somebody says it's okay, anything goes. And I, I kind of, I wonder what is your response to that? So the, the term shame is tricky just because different people define it differently. Mm -hmm. um, I heard one person say that um, guilt is I've done a bad thing. Shame is I'm a bad person and that we mm -hmm. have to distinguish between the two things. I mm -hmm. think people should feel guilty uh, for watching um, the violation and degradation 
um, of, of precious human beings. I think they should feel guilty for wanting that and desiring that. And I think that guilt should drive them away from that. Mm -hmm. um, this idea that we shouldn't, we should never feel ashamed of ourselves for doing anything that we should never feel guilty for anything is bizarre to me. Mm -hmm. And it's also only applied to sexuality. So, you know, there was a couple of major stories in, in the Daily Mail and the Telegraph and a bunch of UK publications um, after the publication of a massive analysis of, of the impact of pornography in schools. And there were school counselors quoted in some of these articles saying that there are girls that have been permanently damaged due to violent sex that they have undergone, have been told they are okay with consenting to, but have had to get stitches in their behinds that they are told that this stuff is mainstream. And I, I'm not referring to one story. There's multiple stories. This is being covered in mainstream publications, not just by... Um, not just by anti-porn activists who are trying to get their research wherever they can. This is publicly no, uh, known. Should people uh, feel um, guilty about wanting to degrade and humiliate a young woman? I, I don't understand why that's a difficult question to answer at all. Um, like I have a daughter, and if and if somebody somebody if somebody is aroused by the idea of humiliating or objectifying somebody, um, then my own opinion on violence might change markedly. Upon discovering that this is just it, it's just ridiculous. We don't apply these standards anywhere else. Why are we applying it to the most fraught and complicated aspect of human intimacy uh, that exists? Do these people not have mothers or sisters or daughters themselves. It makes no sense to me. Mm -hmm. um, but should men be ashamed of anything? Right. Is it just about getting consent for something? Is that what makes the difference? Um, I just I, I don't I don't understand how a sane, humane thinking person can make the case that a young man shouldn't feel ashamed for wanting to degrade a young woman. I don't. And I would love to debate that person if they're going to make that case. What and now? How does that when you're talking about the violent content? I think that the a clear line seems to be able to be drawn there. But what about the person who justifies by saying, well, I just watch you know, I maybe have the watch a cam girl who mm -hmm. is in her own room with no partner, just doing self-stimulation or whatever, whatever yep. content that is. How, how do you apply that same argument there? So I would apply the standard differently. Mm -hmm. I, I definitely think that there is uh, like fundamental differences mm -hmm. between watching OnlyFans and watching the mainstream, you know, pornography that features violence across all platforms. Um, and so I think that if that that person quitting pornography will have less damage to work through um, because somebody who has gotten themselves addicted to sexual violence is going to have to eliminate that addiction and is going to have to navigate the um, after effects of that addiction in an, in a relationship with another person, especially somebody maybe who isn't enthused at the idea uh, of being degraded or humiliated in a sexual relationship. And I talk to people all the time who found that porn bled into their relationships and that they're being asked to do things that they mm -hmm. find abhorrent, that they find the, the opposite of nurturing, the opposite of tender, the opposite of romantic. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I, I think that there, I think there are some forms of pornography that are objectively less horrifying, mm -hmm. um, that are less, uh, less awful uh, than others. But I, I object to pornography across the board on on moral grounds i also think that there are some female porn performers who have more culp more culpability and some who have less mm -hmm. um there there are some of them um, who are being more exploited uh some of them in the only fans industry for example who are doing the exploiting that doesn't change the nature of what pornography is which is participating in objectification and it doesn't change the impact that pornography has on you so I would I would posit those two points. I would say no, it's not it's not in my view as morally horrifying as viewing and being aroused by violent porn. At the same time, it's still participating, I think, in something morally objectionable by definition. I also just think it's pathetic, um, and I do I don't think we bring that up enough. I think there's something so like so profoundly kind of sad and 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 like and you know soul sucking to to, to picture. You know, I'm, I, this is your version of what masculinity has become. Somebody satisfying themselves in a bedroom looking at somebody on the internet. Mm -hmm. um, so it just sort of defies my idea of, 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 of what I think young men should be and what men in general can be, um, right? I, I do believe um, that, that men can do great things. I think they can be defenders, protectors. They can be nurturers. They can do all kinds of phenomenal things in their careers. And it's just the most depressing reductionist version of masculinity I can possibly think of. 
Yeah, it does seem like porn is a great pacifier for men. It is. Absolutely it is. I, I think two of the great pacifiers of men are video games, which gives them the rush of accomplishment without any real accomplishment, and pornography, which gives them all of the rush of sexual um, a sexual activity without having to go through any of the hard work and human interaction it takes to get that. Mm -hmm. The digital how age has not been kind to men. No, I, I would agree. And how do you... how? can we offer a positive vision for young men in the face of these things that are so easy and so tempting? I, I just, I, I really do think at the root of it. So there's, there's all kinds of different um, strategies I can put forward. Right. And so like, I've, I, I there's, I, I know, I know I, I care about tons of people who have been addicted to porn um, that have gotten free of pornography. I would just say, like people are worth it and real life is really worth it. Your relationships are more important than pornography and pornography harms all of your relationships in some way or another. Um, and that, that, that de de detracting from your masculinity by participating in this, you were, you were made for greater things than that. So there's both the guilt and there's the aspiration. It's, it's wrong. It's wrong because you're participating in something fundamentally objectifying and degrading. It's also wrong because it, it degrades you because it inhibits you from being the kind of man or woman that, that you should be. And so I just think that we should just reject this sexual pacifier. I think pacifier is actually a, a really good word. Um, and that people are, are, are really worth it. That there is, that there is genuine intimacy, genuine relationship, genuine adventure that starts when you turn that off and turn on to real life. Is this, uh, why do you think this isn't being talked about more? I mean, there are research articles and there are papers that come out, but I don't, as, as big an issue as, as you, you talked about in the beginning that the, you can't really talk about any of these major cultural problems without coming back to pornography. Well, why is it not being centered more? Why are we not having the conversation more publicly? I think the conversation is starting. Um, so 10 years ago, I would, I would have said that, that, that the analysis you just expressed was, was true without caveat. Um, I remember when I was, I was making the case that porn fuels rape culture, um, which uh, was an argument that had the, the delightful novelty of annoying both sides, um, progressives because they didn't like the fact that I was saying porn created rape culture and conservatives because they didn't like the term rape culture at all. Um, and I, I debated on this on, 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 on public radio. And it was people kind of laughed and kind of just made fun of it. And the comment section rapidly filled up with self-justifying porn addicts um, who revealed in, in, in the way that they decided to mock the debate um, that they were an example of precisely what I was driving at. I would say now, though, that um, that for the pornography, the pornography pandemic has saturated culture to the point that it's forced a discussion that would have been impossible a couple of years ago. Um, in Canada, they're considering age verification. They're doing that in response to the fact that there's a problem they can no longer ignore. Half a dozen American states have done the same thing. The UK is desperately trying to figure out how to do it after two government reports, delineating a lot of the evidence we just went over over the past hour. Again, I mentioned the French Attorney General recommended actually prosecuting pornographers in his report released last fall. The government of Spain is now considering an age verification law. Uh, so actually um, is uh, the government of Australia. The Scandinavian countries are trying to figure out how to reduce porn consumption and keep it away from the young. I do think actually um, that a discussion that was almost non-existent a couple of years ago is finally breaking to the surface. And the sort of discussion that we just had um, is going to become much more mainstream in, in the next couple of years. Well, I hope you're right about that. Have Have you faced any backlash for talking about this? Because I know I've talked with other people who've um, who've been pretty viciously uh, attacked by porn advocates when they try to talk about this issue. Yeah, a little bit. Um, like I would say on on the list of things that I talk about publicly or that I write about publicly, pornography is further down the list. Uh, of things that people get angry at me about, um, as you as you mentioned earlier, like I talk about gender gender ideology is probably the one that gets the fiercest backlash easily. Sort of the LGBT movement stuff, um, abortion to a degree. With pornography, it's kind of strange because the uh, the alliances and the coalitions, pardon me, are always shifting, mm -hmm. right? So when I write something on pornography and rape culture, it's always weird who will be opposed to it and who won't. I might get a libertarian who agrees with me on another issue who's really angry about this. And I 
like I have radical feminists who who very much disagree with me on, on the abortion issue, um, who regularly share my content on pornography and gender ideology. So it's sort of bewildering. Like I've had porn producers and porn porn performers come at me on social media. Lots of people have tried to sign me up for porn subscriptions, not mm. realizing that I have to confirm the subscription in my email mm. inbox. So I just delete them all. I, it's not that big of a deal per se, though. I don't. I wouldn't say. I wouldn't say that I've gotten attacked in any way that's bothered me at all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, that's good. Well, is there is there anything, any final thoughts that we didn't get to in this conversation that you think are important, or any resources that you want to point out or recommend? Sure. Um, so I write about this regularly at my own website, uh, thebridgehead.ca. I try to cover all the new studies that come out. Um, those of you who want to look a little bit into the way that pornography affects the brain, I would take a look at Fight the New Drug. Uh, Fight the New Drug. It's got some great documentaries that illustrates this, as well as the resource This Is Your Brain on Porn. Um, uh, Fight the New Drug, as well as Covenant Eyes. Covenant Eyes have great resources for how to get free uh, of pornography. And if you're somebody who struggles with pornography or even occasionally looks at it, I would urge you to do so. Um, the final note uh, that I would want to leave everybody on um, is that neuroplasticity is the good news and the bad news. Uh, neuroplasticity is the reason pornography is so potent and the reason it reshapes our minds. Um, it also means that our brains can be restored. It means that that neural wiring can be overcome. And so for anybody who's struggling with pornography and, and feels desperate, what I would say is that um, everybody I know who has committed to quitting porn has successfully done so. Uh, for some of them, it's been a much harder struggle than others. Some of them have relapsed and others have not. Everybody has, however, successfully gotten free of pornography. And so if any of what we've talked about over the last hour has been persuasive to you, I would encourage you um, that you too can be free of pornography, that your brain can be restored, and that you can start uh, pursuing the fullness of human relationships without this toxic garbage being pumped into your frontal cortex from your digital devices. Well, thank you so much, Jonathan. It's been really a pleasure to speak with you. And uh, I hope that people will check out those resources. And I'll put links down below to your Substack and your podcast and some of the other resources that you mentioned in the conversation. Well, thank you so much for having me. Thank you.